Okay. Uh, welcome to the session of numerical analysis and the scientific computing uh, of the I uh, virtual ICM 2022. My name is Takashi Kumagai from Waseda University in Japan. It is my great honor to welcome Professor Gita uh, Kutinyok uh, from uh, Ludwig uh, Maximilian University, uh, München. Uh, the title of her talk, uh, her lecture is The Math Mathematics of Artificial uh, in Intelligence. So please start. Yeah, thank you very much. So let me start by sharing my screen. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the very nice introduction. I would also like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me. It's certainly a great pleasure and honor for me to give a talk here uh, in this section. Now, I think we all know how tremendously successful artificial intelligence is these days, but at the same time, we are also aware that there is still a lack of a profound mathematical underpinning of this whole area. And so in this talk, I would like to give you a gentle introduction into this field and also show which key theoretical directions there are. Um, and also then, I mean, a particular focus of my talk, since this is a section on numerical analysis and scientific computing will be on those directions um, at, uh, in the second half of my presentation. Now, I think we all know if we look around us that artificial intelligence is infusing public life in various instances, I mean, just think of self-driving cars, think of speech recognition, think also of legal issues. So often, for instance, job applications are already pre-screened by using methods of artificial intelligence. And then the whole healthcare sector, which as we know, unfortunately these days became even more important than it already is. And then if we get a bit closer to sciences, also there we see spectacular success. So for instance, here in the area of biology uh, concerning protein folding, prediction of protein folding structures, um, what one realizes is that with these new algorithms, which are here called alpha fold, one makes in some sense a gigantic leap forward. You see that here in this uh, also small graphics, how much the gain is in uh, prediction quality. And then if we get to mathematics itself, we also see there is a tremendous impact already on mathematics. So it started around 2012 with the area of inverse problems, imaging sciences. And after a very short of amount of time, many state-of-the-art algorithms in this area already used these type of new methods, solving problems like, for instance, denoising, edge detection, in painting, and so on. So then, I mean, one can ask, why is this area so accessible to these learning type methods? But I mean, an image itself, I mean, there is no rigorous model for it. So therefore, that makes this field so accessible to these type of methods from artificial intelligence. The other or another area in, let's say, scientific computing is numerical analysis of partial differential equations. And as you see, this was much slower to embrace methods from artificial intelligence. Why? Well, I mean, because a partial differential equation is a physical model itself. So it is not per se clear why we actually need these new methods to maybe derive better solvers. But what turned out is that in the high dimensional regime, these methods are extremely successful and can often circumvent the curse of dimensionality. So therefore, from 2017 on, also research there just took off. Now that looks all very bright, but then um, just a couple of years ago, there was a big AI conference and one of the persons who was awarded a prize gave a plenary speech and there he said machine learning and so also artificial intelligence is still at a level of alchemy. And if we look back now and look where we stand at this point, well, I mean, there was a lot of progress, but still, uh, for instance, training neural networks is still a lot of trial and error. Selecting the architecture, the model is also still based on the experience of the programmer and so on. So right now we are still to a certain extent of the level of alchemy and there need to be much more progress in the theoretical direction. And even worse, there's also a severe problem with reliability. So for instance, here you see BBC News claimed computers can be made to see a sea turtle as a gun. 
And many of you might also know that one can fool self-driving cars by putting stickers in a particular way on traffic signs. And then the car can make a sudden, very wrong decision. So one can now think about what is the role of mathematics in all this. I mean, from my perspective, there are two key challenges for mathematics. One is mathematics for artificial intelligence, asking questions like, can we derive the profound mathematical understanding? Can we ensure reliability? And then artificial intelligence for mathematics, meaning for mathematical problem settings, in particular, scientific computing. So can we use these new methods, for instance, to improve solvers on the area of imaging sciences, inverse problems, and also in the area of partial differential equations? As I said, since this session is on numerical analysis and scientific computing, we put a bit more emphasis on the second direction. But for the first direction, I would also like to show you a couple of glimpses into research there. But let me now first start with a very gentle introduction into artificial intelligence to set the common ground. Everything started in 1943 with McCullough and Pitts. And their goal was artificial intelligence. And so what they did was quite smart. I mean, we humans, at least we believe that we are intelligent. So what they aimed to do was to mimic the functionality of the human brain. So how does this human brain work or is constructed of? Well, I mean, you have neurons and these are connected to a network. And so the first step now is to mimic a neuron to create an artificial neuron and then connect them to an artificial neural network. So let's see how that works. Um, so how does a neuron work? Well, I mean, we get here an input of signals, you call them x1, x2, x3, and so on. Then we have these dendrites through which the signals travel. Due to the structure of the dendrites, this might be amplified. So these are the weights, w1, w2, and so on. Everything is collected then in the soma, this is here the sum over x i w i. And then the neuron needs to decide whether to fire or not and at which strengths. And that is mimicked here by comparing this accumulated sum with a bias term. The bias acts there as a threshold. So if the sum is greater than the bias, it fires a one, otherwise it does not fire at all. And then here the next neurons are connected. So now these artificial neurons, you'll make that more precise on the next slide, we will then connect to a neural network. And then one can ask, what are still the free parameters? And the free parameters are the weights and the biases. So this is what we will then in the end learn. Okay, so let's be a bit more mathematically precise. An artificial neuron with weights, W1 up to Wn, a bias term, an activation function, which is, you see, univariate. Um, that an artificial neuron based on this is defined in this way. And you immediately realize that this row on the previous slide was the heavy side function. But certainly it makes a lot of sense to choose here more flexibility because you don't want to output just ones or zeros. Yeah, so one choice for row is the heavy side function. But if you would like to have something smoother, you can choose the sigmoid function. What is nowadays most of the time used is what's called the rectifiable linear unit. It's a very simple function, the max of zero and x, a piecewise linear function. But apparently for all practical purposes, this seems to be sufficient. So now we have these artificial neurons, we connect them. So let's make a little example. Uh, please take a look here. Um, all these yellow balls are now artificial neurons. They get their input from here and then they output in this direction. So this we now encode in mathematical terms. How do we do that? Well, I mean, we have here our x, x1, x2, x3, so it's in R3. Uh, these connections we encode in a matrix of this type. And what you see here is this first component is this way times x1 plus this way times x2. This is this first row. Then we have here this way times x3, which is this connection, and this way times x3, which is this connection. Next, we add the bias term, b1, the components of it, and we apply the activation function component funds. And then we keep going. So the next connections are encoded by this matrix, since we now move from r3 to r2. And again, we add a bias term and so on. So what you realize here is um, 
this formula is a composition of ephralinear maps and activation functions. And so now you can imagine how the general formula for a neural network looks like. Uh, so you see this here. It is a composition of FR linear functions and activation functions, which are applied component-wise. And as you already saw from the previous slide, the neurons are uh, assigned, uh, constructed in, in, in layers, or arranged in layers, I should say. And of particular concern is also the number of layers. Um, and this is coincides here with the number of FR linear functions, because what turned out is that neural networks are much more effective if you have uh, an extensive over parameterization, also deep neural networks. So therefore the depth is so important. Now we have the computation power to train deep neural networks. So to get to the key theoretical questions, um, I would now like to take you one slide through how we apply a neural network. And from those then, the theoretical directions for mathematics for artificial intelligence will arise. So the goal is now to learn a function which we don't know from which we just know sample values. It's a highly complicated function. Maybe it's also defined on a lower dimensional manifold, which is usually assumed in imaging sciences. And maybe it's a classification function. Yeah, so here is a little example, let's say on one area, we have images of cats, which are mapped to the value one. In the other area, we have images of dogs, which are mapped to the value two. What you have at hand now are just samples, so images and the function values, which are here the labels one or two in this example. Now, these samples you split in a training and a test data set. The test data set you set aside, the training data set you now use for training. So now we want to construct a neural network or learn a neural network which approximates this function. So first we have to decide about the architecture of the neural network, how many layers it has, how many neurons in each layer, which activation function. Maybe we would not like to have a fully connected network because that's always bad for training, but we would like to pre-select certain edges so that corresponds to setting entries of these matrices equal to zero. Once we've decided that, then we train the new network, meaning we learn the weights and the biases. How do we do that? Well, by an optimization procedure. Now, please take a look here. We have our neural network function. We apply it to these XIs. And um, what we want is that this is close to F of XI. The closeness is given by a loss function. So this could be, for instance, the square loss. Uh, so the difference squared. Then we also have the chance to incorporate additional properties of the weights and the biases. So maybe you would like to have them sparse. So that means we can place the L1 norm here. Huh? But in general, this is a regularization term, which gives us a bit more flexibility. We then sum up overall training samples and minimize. This we do by stochastic gradient descent. Why don't we use gradient descent? Well, we usually have training samples in the millions and we don't want to compute a million gradients. So therefore we choose certain gradients and assume that they give a good average. Now that's stochastic gradient descent. Once you've done that and solved the problem, you have the weights and the biases. So your neural network function, and now you hope that you did a good job. And you check this by applying your neural network function to the train, the test, sorry, the test data set. So these XIs hopefully getting the correct function value also for those. And remember, the neural network during training has not seen the test data set before. So what are the key theoretical directions? Well, that's the area of expressivity asking about the effect of the network architecture to the performance. So this is usually a purely approximation theoretic question. Also, for instance, areas like applied harmonic analysis are taken into account there. Maybe the most explored direction. Learning, well, stochastic gradient descent performs actually quite well, which is very surprising because the problem is highly non-convex. So the question is, why does the algorithm indeed converge to, let's say, good local minima? And many areas come into play there. Also, let's say, more exotic areas in this direction, like algebraic differential geometry, to understand the shape of the minima. And then maybe the holy grail of everything, generalization. Can we get success guarantees how the neural network will perform on the test data set? 
Uh, so that requires learning theory, statistics, and so on. These three directions are exactly the three components if we view the problem as a statistical learning problem. And although, I mean, the main focus of my talk will be on numerical analysis, scientific computing, still, I mean, the generalization aspect is extremely important for it. So I would like to show you now a tiny glimpse into what, um, what can be done uh, on this problem and where we are. So it's, it's actually very surprising that networks generate that well. And let me explain you why. Uh, we make a small example, just separating two classes, these green dots from the blue stops. And let's assume a neural network is not that expressive. It can just draw lines. Then you see you will do a very bad job in separating and classifying. If your network is a bit more flexible, um, you can separate in this way. And that's already very good because this green dot is most likely an outlier. If your network has too much flexibility and too many parameters, it could try to do something like this, to enclose one class too closely. And that's not a great idea because then you can easily misclassify other points and new points. So that's called overfitting. And for some reason, neural networks do not run into this problem. And there is this famous double descent curve. So let me explain to you what, uh, what, what this phenomena is. Um, this, what you see here, comes from statistical learning theory. That's the classical view. You have the capacity of the hypothesis class, which corresponds here to the complexity of my neural network, the number of parameters, and the error. The training error certainly will go down as my network increases. But the test error at some point will grow up again, because that's the overfitting, this phenomenon. But for some reason, for neural networks, this figure is true. So after some point here, the test error will go down again and much more than it was before. So that's the double descent curve and that's not fully understood yet. There are many approaches like we see dimension, very classical, Radha Maha complexity and something very new neural tangent kernels. So there's a lot of research going on in that direction. I would like to show you now one partial result um, which actually solved that partial problem completely. And that is for neural networks, but a generalization for neural networks, which is also extremely popular these days, which are graph neural networks. Graph neural networks don't take Euclidean data as input, but signals over graphs. Now, so a graph signal is a signal defined on the graph nodes up to R C. Now, so for each node, you have a vector, a so-called feature vector assigned. That's the input of your neural network. And you can imagine there are many examples, recommender systems, fake news detection, chemistry, and so on. So these graph neural networks are, it's, it's a very, let's say, vivid stream of research these days. And you can certainly also ask the generalization question for this. And this is a classical question. The graph neural network should generalize to graph signals which are unseen in the training set. That's what we discussed. But here there's a special instance, a special case which does not appear for Euclidean data. And that we can now solve completely. The special case is the following. We can have the situation that we have graphs which model the same phenomena, whatever this means for now. And then if one of these graphs is in my training data set, then I certainly expect for generalization that then my network generalizes to all the other graphs which model the same phenomena. Yeah, and so, for instance, this modeling the same phenomena could be that there's a topological space overlying and these graphs are samplings of that. There are also other models for similarity of graphs, like the graphone approach, which is like a limit object of graphs, but for here, I would like to stick with this. Yeah. So that's one part, a special case of generalization ability called transferability. And so this we can, we can solve completely. Um, the key idea here is that you always go via this continuous, this topological space, because there you have much more mathematics available and always compare via this, and then also introduce new functional analytic tools. And then you can show that the success guarantees for this particular type of generalization ability of a graph, your convolutional neural network can be precisely estimated by properties of the associated graph Laplacians and the consistency error, which is related to the density of the sampling. So there is a special case which you can now solve completely. But as I said, 
I mean, we are very far from understanding all these aspects of well, the overall statistical learning error completely. In particular, generalization, I mean, there's a, a ton of work still to be done. So what to do? Well, I mean, there's a new area which aims to in a certain way circumvent this problem. This is the area of explainability. It asks a slightly different question. It asks the question, I have my trained neural network and well, maybe I couldn't analyze it because mathematics is not as far at this point, but I still want to know how it reaches decisions. And you can imagine how important that is for applications. And I think it's a very exciting direction. I think it still lacks a lot of mathematics still. So let me just spend one slide to explain to you some ideas on this. So the main goal is to understand decisions of what one says black box predictors. So assume I have a trained neural network which recognizes digits. Yeah, and so this network says, well, this is a three, which is obviously correct. Then I want, I want to know why the network reached this decision. So here, for instance, which pixels are responsible for that decision? And then this explainability approach will output like a heat map, which indicates which pixels are most important for this particular network. Yeah? So in here, for instance, this says, well, I mean, these red pixels, these openings were important for the network and this curve here, which is, is reasonable to look for that for classifying this as a three. And maybe these other areas play against it. Still, I mean, this what's called typically relevance map. I mean, it's not clear what this is precisely in a mathematical sense. And also in mathematics, we always want to talk about optimality. And so we are very far from that. I mean, we made a tiny step in that direction by using information theory in combination also with supply harmonic analysis, wavelets to get not pixel-based explanations, but higher level explanations. And so for instance, via this, I mean, what we could do is we could explain why sometimes neural networks reach wrong decisions. Yeah? So here, for instance, you have a neural network, which says this is a diaper, although it's obviously a man with a dog, and this is a screw, although it's obviously a man with a sweater. The pixel-based explanations just say which pixels are important for the decision, and there you don't see anything why this is a wrong, why a wrong decision was reached. But then if you take a bit more higher level viewpoint, you use a wave decomposition, incorporate ideas from information theory, you see the network could mistake this for a baby. And then, I mean, the decision that this is a diaper is not that far off. And also this looks a bit like a screw. But in general, I mean, the vision for the future here would be to get a human-like answer to any question about a decision. And you realize we are extremely far from that and also it's a really highly interdisciplinary field. Still, I mean, from my perspective, it needs a lot more mathematics. So these are, to a certain extent, key directions in mathematics for artificial intelligence. And now I would like to come to the, let's say, opposite direction, which is math artificial intelligence for mathematics. And also, which is then even more closely related to the topic of this section. So one direction are inverse problems. There we ask questions typically like, how do we optimally combine AI based with model based approaches? And is AI also capable of replacing in the end numerical algorithms at all, which is a bit provocative question maybe. And so areas in that direction which are involved are imaging sciences, inverse problems, micro local analysis, and so on. For partial differential equations, it's question are usually slightly different. So here we ask more, what about the high dimensional regime? Why do these algorithms perform that well? So let me start with um, giving you an introduction now into AI for inverse problems and show you some results there. Um, for that, I would like to first just start with classical approach, and then we combine this with neural networks. So what is an inverse problem at all? Well, I mean, we have an operator K, we have a vector, a function f, that could be, for instance, this image. We apply the operator, and maybe the operator takes out certain parts, blackens out parts, we get this image. And now what we want truly is from this image to recover the original, meaning to invert capital K. Uh, or, I mean, K could be also a measurement operator, like magnetic resonance imaging. And then we would like from the measurements 
to get back our original image. And this is typically solved by optimization problems, like for instance here, this is a generalization of what's called Tikhonov regularization. And you see, if we minimize this, what we do here is we aim to solve the inverse problem as accurately as possible. That's the data fidelity term. And then we have a second term, which allows us to incorporate additional properties of the solution. Here, we use a particular regularization term, which is related to the sparse regularization, because we assume that there's always a representation system, which allows us to give a sparse expansion, a sparse representation, meaning with very few large coefficients. And so then this is promoted by placing the L1 on it. And this system, phi i, could be, for instance, wavelets, could be curvelets, it could be bandlets or shearlets. I mean, there are a lot of different choices. And I would like to now give you uh, on, on very few slides a short introduction and define what shearlets are because this we will use later on. Now, so, I mean, later on, we will use shearlets here in, in this instance to solve inverse problems and then also combine that with neural networks. So, shearlets are a pure model based approach. And the model based on which this was designed was introduced by Dave Donahoe. It's the set of cartoon like functions. You see those here. So one assumes that a crude model for an image is um, a curvilinear structure with smooth areas inside and outside. Uh, and you see the precise definition here F0 and F1 are both C2 functions. And then you have B, which is bounded by a C2 discontinuity curve. Now, for this model for images, Dave Donohue also then gave a benchmark result. He showed for an arbitrary representation system, um, this allowing polynomial depth search avoids artificial cases, that the optimum approximation rate for cartoon-like functions is the following. Uh, so at the measure, one takes here the error of best n-term approximation. So what is this? Yeah, you see this here. So you have a budget capital N. And then you're allowed to take n elements of your representation system, build a linear combination, and you will do that so that you best approximate your f. Ah, and so then you make an error. And if this is a complete system, as you let n go to infinity, this converts to zero, and you can wonder at which rate. And the best rate you can achieve for cartoon like functions is n to the minus one. So if you construct a system which gives you this rate, then this is an optimal rate, an optimal system for these cartoon like functions. And well, I mean, if you're familiar with wavelets, these are isotropic functions, isotropic elements. So certainly for curves, not that well adapted. So the idea is to create a system, a representation system, which is more anisotropic like shaped. And shields are one way to go. They are a multi scale system, they are based on parabolic scaling. Uh, so this produces, you see, you scale in both directions in a different way. It produces functions where an essential support looks like this, very needle-like. Um, we change the orientation by shearing. And you see, this now allows us to get faithful implementations in the end. Rotation would not do the job. Uh, and here you see one, one of these shillets in spatial domain. The true definition is, looks a bit complicated, but let's take a look here. You have generating functions that you move around on the plane. You have the scaling operation, and then you also have the shearing operation, which changes the orientation. And the frequency domain is tiled in a highly directional manner. Yeah, and so a shear transform will denote by SH later on, and that means a function f is mapped to inner products of f with shearlets. With this shearlet system, we can now show that for cartoon-like functions, indeed, the error of best n-term approximation meets this n to the minus one, up to a log factor. Uh, so this is now optimal for um, cartoon-like functions up to a log factor. But if you view this as negligible, you can say, no, it's an optimal uh, approximating system. And so you can use it now for sparse regularization. And if you're interested in that, we have a very extensive software library, shearlab.org. So you find different languages here, MATLAB, Julia, Python, TensorFlow, and also a lot of demos, in particular for the area of imaging science. So 
Now we saw a bit classic, a classical approach, sparse regularization with shields. Now let's incorporate deep learning. So there are various approaches how to use neural networks or your deep learning for inverse problems. Maybe you, you can certainly do it end to end, but the best, and you will see that, is if you combine both in an optimal manner. So the easiest you can do is maybe to first uh, use a model-based approach like your normal um, solver, and then use a neural network afterwards for denoising. That's a very ad hoc approach, but it already gives good results. Then for solving this optimization problem, this sparse regularization problem, which we saw before, we use iterative solvers like ADMN. They contain, for instance, a denoising step. And neural networks are really good in denoising. So one idea is to replace this denoising step by a neural network. Now, so this will be plug and play with CNN denoising, CNN convolutional neural network denoising. And then, I mean, you can also replace other steps, proximal steps, by trained neural network that needs to learn iterative schemes. You can go also one step further, which you might call even unsupervised, unsupervised approach where you use a neural network as a generative model for regularization, which then leads to what's called deep image prior. So what I would like to show you here is one approach where a model-based method is driven as far as it's reliable and only then complemented by a neural network. And so in that sense, I mean, I believe that is um, an approach which uses the full power of the model-based methods and restricts, in some sense, the learning part to that part where it's really needed. So we surgically use it just for that part. So I would now like to take you into the world of medical imaging, um, computer tomography. The way that works is you have, for instance, a human body, you compute line integrals through it, so that's the Radon transform. This gives you one slice of the sinogram, then you rotate. So you compute these line integrals at every offset and every angle, uh, and that way you feel the sinogram. And from the sinogram, you now want to recover some from these measurements, the interior of the human body. That becomes really hard if you cannot do a rotation by 180 degrees, which is, for instance, the case uh, and dental CT or electron tomography. And so the way, so the problem you have there is you only have a chunk of a solution and from that you need to recover. So you have a whole missing piece. And the effect you see here, if you have a 60 degree missing angle, for instance, this is your original image. This is a crude reconstruction and um, sparse regularization with shields, which we discussed before, does a better job, but still you have a lot of blurry parts here and here. So how can you solve this problem now? Well, you need to first understand what you actually need to solve. For that, let's take a look at the following. So now I just have a tiny angle where I have measurements and I recover and I do a really bad job. But if I increase this, it gets better and better. Yeah, but you see from an early stage on, we can already dis, dis, um, recover certain edges depending on their directionality to be very precisely. And this has the effect that at a certain point, we can, some of these edges are already visible and others are not, yeah? So, I mean, this is also intuitively clear because for instance, if you compute line integrals in this direction, you will recognize these edges very early on, but these are smeared out. And that can be math made mathematically precise um, when it was done by Quinto. So now you can phrase this problem of recovering these invisible, edges with their directionality in the following way. Uh, so you have here your, let's say, your singularity curve with uh, your direction, and there's a notion for that, which is called the wavefront set. Wavefront set are points, the singularity points together with their direction. And the problem we now have is we are missing a certain part here. So we need to in-paint a part of the wavefront set. That's what the neural network needs to do for us. And fortunately, I mean, one can show shields, identify the wavefront set, and can also separate the visible and invisible part. And the algorithm we then suggested was the following. Yeah, so the first we already saw, that's this classical sparse regularization. We have the operator here, the data fidelity term, we have the regularization term, yeah, inner products of F with my shields, the L1 norm, and we have here also a weight 
since we have a multi-scale system. We get this not that great outcome. But then now we use a second time a shielded transform. And we now find out that some of these coefficients which we get are already reliable and perfect, but others are not. So that way we can find out which parts we can not recover using model-based approaches. And only those, these invisible coefficients, these we learn. So we now train a network from the visible ones to recover the invisible ones. Uh, and so now this F I combine with the visible ones and I bring it back to the image domain. And let's see how, how that looks. Uh, so you see here, this is my original image. This is my filter back projection, so a crude reconstruction. Again, I have the 60 degree missing angle. That is maybe a good model-based approach, sparse regularization with shields. This is a pro an approach which only uses a neural network without any model-based approach. And you see, you do already a better job, but the best you can do is to combine both worlds in a very good manner. Now, so here driving the model-based approach as far as it's reliable and then complement with the neural network where it's needed. And this general philosophy, you can now apply to a lot of other problems. For instance, here, edge detection, um, where you have your original image. This is human annotation. This is a model-based approach. And here you see the deep learning approach combined with the model-based approach, where we basically first use the shielded transform and let the neural network act in the shielded domain. And you see, you can even then also very clearly find out the directionality of the edges by this color coding. So one can say for inverse problems, I mean, neural networks are extremely effective, but you need to combine that in the correct way with model-based approaches. So what about partial differential equations? So why should we use these approaches for solving PDEs at all? Now, the classical approach is the following. You have your PDE, your differential operator, your right-hand side, your solution. And we now want to approximate the solution by a neural network. Uh, so this is what you now use for training. That way you need to train your neural network. And uh, so there's a lot of contributions really starting from 2017. What I would like to now show you is one result in the direction of parametric PDEs. So this family of PDEs, which is guided by a parameter, maybe a design parameter. So, the design parameter could be, for instance, as I said, I mean, different structures, or it could also be heat, I mean, different impacts, for instance, on material. Now, you see, I mean, here you have, again, the differential operator, you have the right-hand side, you have the solution, everything depends on why, why is the parameter from some parameter space, and what you aim to do is, given the parameter, compute the solution. And the problem is, I mean, this is the so-called parametric map, that the computational cost can be extremely high. So the question is, can you use neural networks for resolving this problem? So can we use a neural network to approximate the parametric map? So let's first bring everything to the finite dimensional situation. Yeah, so this is what you see here is not already the high fidelity discretization. Uh, capital D is the dimension of the space, so this is the coefficient vector, which corresponds to the solution. Maybe my parameter space also is embedded in some RP. And now I would like to analyze whether I can mimic this by a neural network. Then I have a very flexible approach, hopefully also very fast computations. And theoretically, I can ask also, does there exist a network at all which does the job and approximates this parametric map for any parameter? And how does the complexity depend on these key dimensions? Does it suffer from the curse of dimensionality? And now ideally, I so you see, this is an expressivity question. Does there exist a neural network? But what you ideally would like to have are now generalization guarantees. And that's still out of reach. So instead one can drive extensive numerical experiments to then show that way that also numerically it does not suffer from the curse of dimensionality. And so, I mean, we could we could do that. We could show that there exists a neat neural network which approximates the parametric map and the dependence on the complexity of the complexity of the network on the dimensions is benign. 
And the numerical experiments which we drove then also show then also numerically, once you train neural networks, the performance does not suffer from the curse of dimensionality. So we saw neural networks are really effective for um, inverse problems and also for partial differential equations. So let me finish my lecture with a word of caution. And the word of caution comes from computability. Now, so what is the computable problem? It is one for which the input output relation can be computed on the digital machine for any given accuracy. Yeah, so that's what we expect if we train a neural network. But there are problems if we train a neural network on digital hardware, because what we could show is that the solution of a finite dimension inverse problem is not computable by a neural network. It's not Turing computable. It's even not what's, not what's called banach mazur computable. Uh, and so this is a problem not of the solver. It's a problem of the hardware which is used these days. Uh, but I mean, today, these computations are always, uh, everything is always computed on digital hardware, on GPUs. Um, let me say that there is also related work around uh, Anders Hansen, who used an Oracle Turing machine, but from our perspective, that's a bit far from, from reality because it has a second band and uh, Turing and uh, banach mazur computable in particular is, is closer to, I mean, our real situation. So let me state again, I mean, the problem, there is no algorithm for which on digital hardware derives neural networks which approximates the solution for any given accuracy. So the output of the neural network is not reliable. We don't have guarantees. So even if we have theoretical guarantees, we cannot say whether the computed result is within this range. And this could point towards why instabilities and non-robustness happens. So this seems like a really serious problem and, and I agree. So what is the way out? Well, in fact, I mean, there are a lot of other emerging hardware types, neuromorphic computing, biocomputing, and so on. And so these are certainly models which one can use and one can ask does this non-computability problem also occur here on such analog computers. And what we could show is that the solution of a finite dimension inverse problem is computable on an analog machine. And here for an analog machine, we use the bloom schubs mail machine. So this points towards using new hardware, analog hardware, which gives us then hopefully true reliability. So let me finish my talk with uh, some final thoughts. I mean, I hope I convinced you artificial intelligence shows, I mean, impressive performance in real world applications, but a mathematical foundation of it is to a large extent still missing, but in great need. Then, I mean, we discussed two different directions of research, mathematics for AI and AI for mathematics. So here, these are these four main areas, expressivity, learning, generalization. We delved a little bit deeper into that and explainability and AI for mathematics. Um, so inverse problems and partial differential equations. And I also said a word of caution that there are problems with computability on digital hardware. But from my perspective in general, I mean, there are really exciting future perspectives for mathematics in this field. And with this, I would like to close and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for this beautiful and uh, very inspiring uh, lecture. I would also thank the audience for participation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, there is no possibility of questions and comments here. Instead, I, I just learned that uh, uh, a, dis <clears throat> a Discord server has been set up to discuss the virtual ICM lectures. And so please go to the homepage of the virtual ICM 2022. Then you can find the link to the virtual ICM 2022 talks. If you click that uh, link, then you can find the uh, Discord server. So I, I guess Professor uh, Kukinok, uh will be there so you can yes. communicate with her uh, uh, in this way. Anyway, I believe uh, everyone, everybody has enjoyed the lecture very much. And we close the session uh, with uh, applause to Professor Kutinok. Thank you.
So thank you very much and uh, bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you.